Praise the Lord and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here from uh, Amazing Grace Faith Church uh, in Bukoto. Uh, this is a midweek service and effective tonight we shall be online uh, for the midweek service because of uh, the difficulties of course in movement due to strict adherence to curfew. So in order to help you enjoy the service without any kind of disturbance, we shall be going online uh, for the midweek service, that is Wednesday at 7, and then uh, the Sunday service at 10.30, you can always come in, and you should always come in here at Amazing Refrain Church in Bukoto, but the midweek uh, shall be holding online uh, for some time until uh, we see how the, I mean, the curfew and all the other restrictions uh, shall be changing. Uh, thank you so much once again uh, for joining. I believe that you're going to be blessed in Jesus' mighty name. Tonight, which is a midweek service, also doubles as the third day of our week of spiritual empowerment for the month of June. Every time we have spiritual week of empowerment, it is every time we have spiritual week of empowerment, it is to recharge, it is to refuel, it is uh, to re-energize, it is to refresh ourselves in the things of the spirit because we understand that everything around our lives rotates or is determined by the state of our spiritual life. So we take off uh, some time every, uh, every month to make sure that we recharge, we refocus ourselves. We come before God, yes, in seven days of fasting and we are asking God for speedy acceleration. We are asking for supernatural acceleration. We are asking for supernatural acceleration as we come, of course, to the end of the first half of the year. We are believing God that in this year of divine speed, there shall not be delay, there shall not be stagnation, there shall not be denial, there shall not be uh, long waiting, but whatever God has ordained for us at specific times shall be accomplished, and we shall be accomplishing destiny and fulfilling destiny on schedule in Jesus' mighty name. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. The Bible tells us that why we look not are the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When you move in the things, I mean in the realm of the spirit, those are things you can't see with your physical eyes. But yet those things are more, I mean they are, they are eternal, they are more real than the things of the flesh. So when we, we set ourselves into prayer and fasting, what we are saying is we are focusing on the realm of the spirit, putting a demand on God to affect the changes that we desire in the realm of the sin. In Matthew 17, 21, Jesus tells his disciples that this kind goeth not, but by prayer and by fasting. There is a kind, there's a kind of progress, there's a kind of success, the kind of speed that only comes uh, through prayer and fasting. And that's what we shall be focusing on uh, this evening. Understanding intercession, understanding intercession. And that is also... Uh, of course, mixing it with uh, uh, prayer and fasting. From the days of old, fasting has been known as a means of getting answers to prayer. So much such that even people that don't know God engage in fasting of some kind when they have things that they desire to see in their life. And uh, because of this, many people even think, or even uh, some of us used to think, that there's a way fasting changes God, that there's a way like fasting affects God and makes him do things that maybe he didn't want to do. But as we began to grow and to mature in the Lord, we discover that fasting does not change God. For God says that I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you descendants of Jacob are not consumed. That is in Malachi. It says I am the Lord, I change not. So fasting does not change God. And how, but, but how fasting gets for us answers to prayer is that fasting changes us. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God does not change because you fasted. His will is to bless you. Before you fasted, even before you thought of fasting, God wants to bless you. God is looking for a way of increasing you. God is looking for a way of moving you faster. What happens is, without fasting, without understanding intercession, we find ourselves stagnated. We find ourselves moving at a speed that we don't like, and the reason is because our nature is not tuned to what the Spirit of God is saying. It's not tuned to what God is doing. 
So we find ourselves moving at a very slow pace. So what fasting does is that it changes us and makes us the kind of instruments that easily receive and connect with answers from God. Tonight, we shall be looking at what I said as understanding intercession. Of course, like I said, along with fasting, like you cannot separate those two. Prayer and fasting cannot be separated. Yes, it is. It, they, they are friends. They are twins. They go, they go together. Of course, you cannot be uh, fasting all the time, but we are told in the scriptures to pray without ceasing. What is intercession? Intercession is, it, it is to be situated in between things in order to alter the outcome uh, of those things. It is to be situated between things in order to alter the outcome. If a person wants to do something for another person, and for some reason the other person is not ready or is not positioned or doesn't know, you stand in the middle and you mediate and you make sure that everyone is on the same page so that the, whatever is desired can be done. That is what intercessors do. And what is fasting? Fasting is abstaining uh, from food and pleasure in order to focus on the things of the spirit. So when we intercede uh, through fasting, what it means is that we abstain from food and pleasure in order to mediate, in order to intercede, in order to stand. I mean, we stand in the gap between God and man, between God and men, between God and, 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 and the things that he wants to change. Why? Because you see, the fall brought in a situation in creation where God cannot just intervene in the affairs of men. Like God can't just come and start uh, doing things the way he wants, much as that's the way some people think that is not the truth. If God had the right to come and change everything and make it the way he wants, then the, the world wouldn't be the way it is. We wouldn't be seeing the murders and the, and, and the confusion and the sickness and the disease and the, and the death and the, and the hatred and all, that, all the evil that you see. If God was truly and fully in charge of the world, you would not see such kind of things. Why? Because that's not the nature of God, and we all know that. The only place that God is in charge is in heaven. And when Jesus was teaching us to pray, he says, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, allowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know heaven is perfection at best. Are you understanding? Why? Because God is fully in charge. Now, here on earth, God, yes, indeed, wants to be in charge. But he must, uh, there must be an agent. There must be someone that permits him to come and take charge here on earth. And that is who we are. We as human beings. In Psalms 115 verse 16, it says the earth, I mean the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. The earth is ours. He has given it to us. For him to come and operate here on earth and do good, and, and rid the earth of coronavirus, and rid the earth of murders, and, and, and all manner of evils, he needs us, to his children, to invite him, to invite him, to call upon him, to ask him to come, and to intervene in the affairs of men. That is the role of the church on this earth. We are here, the church is here on earth as intercessors, primarily as intercessors, to stand between, uh, I mean, God and the, uh, and the perishing human, uh, human nature, and then they intercede. We ask God for his mercy to reign and to prevail over the lives of the people. That's why in, uh, in first Corinthians, uh, Second Corinthians says we are ambassadors of Christ. Uh, we, we stand in between uh, heaven and earth and we ask God, save, God, deliver, God, set free, God, uh, intervene, God, heal, God, set free. Why? Because it is us who have the right over this earth to effect the changes that we want to see, and that is the power of intercession. I love, uh, I read something, I think about 12 uh, years ago, uh, that said that it seems like God can, he, he wants to do a lot on earth, but he is limited by the prayers of the saints. God wants to do a lot on earth. He wants to change people, he wants to heal, he wants to deliver, he wants to set free, but he is limited by the prayers of the saints. He's limited by those who are actually supposed to be asking him to do such kind of things. And of course, we know there's an eternal enemy of God, called the devil. I mean, he 
always also wants to impose his will on the earth. And uh, as you can see, his will uh, tends to prevail. Why? Because it's like for him, when man fell, he gave him the legal right, the unlimited right to work havoc on earth without even being invited. So we know that you don't have to, uh, I mean, to ask for evil to increase. All you have to do is not pray and evil will just increase. All you have to do is not, not uh, seek God and evil will just prevail. All you have to do is just do nothing and evil will just prevail. Now, to do, I mean, to see good, you must do something. But to see evil, it's like you don't have to do anything. Just be idle and evil will just, will just prevail. And that shall not be your portion in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So we are here. We as Christians are here as intercessors. As we take our place as intercessors, as we take our place and we situate, I mean, we get, we become situated between heaven and earth to ensure that we pray for the will of God to be done on earth, God begins to alter the course of nations. God begins to alter people's lives. God begins to alter things. And guess what? He rewards us for every life that is transformed. He rewards us with the same kind of breakthroughs. He rewards us with the same kind of what? Of, of things that we're praying to happen in the lives of other people. That is, that is important for you to understand. Because many people think, why should I be focusing on praying for other people, yet I also need these things? Listen, when you stand as an intercessor, when you stand in between heaven and earth to pray for the mercy of God to prevail on earth, you qualify actually for those things that you're asking for others and so much more. Why? Because that is the nature of God. He cannot bless those you're praying for and then he abandons you. And I, I, I see you uh, being blessed through intercession in Jesus' mighty name. Let me repeat uh, this before I move on to what we're supposed to be uh, praying for and where our focus is supposed to be. That we Christians are primarily on this earth as intercessors. We are here to effect the will of God through our prayers. We are here to effect the course of nations through our prayers. We are here to, I mean, to alter those things that are moving in the wrong direction to bring them in the right direction. I read a book, I think you can look for it if you can, by Kenneth Hagin called The Art of Intercession. And in that book, he explains uh, what God was showing him and what God was teaching him. And in many cases, he shows that many people's lives, your relatives, your friends, your loved ones, your parents, your children, many people's lives could have turned out so much better, so much better, if only the Christians in their lives were able to take position. He explains in that book that many people's lives, many people's lives, our loved ones, I mean our relatives, our fathers, our mothers, our children, our, our brothers, our sisters, our, our friends, their lives would have turned out so much better if we, the Christians, in their lives knew how to intercede, how to pray, how to be situated between them and God and to effect the good things that we want to see in their lives. A lot of times we see the need that is in the lives of the people that we love. And we, we, because we try to talk to them and maybe they are, some are even inaccessible and you have nothing you can do about, you, you feel like you, there's nothing you can do about it. But let me tell you something. Above even talking to people in your life, above uh, speaking to them and trying to make them change and try to make them do the right thing, the most important, the most powerful, the most effective thing you can do for the people you love is to learn to intercede for them, is to learn to pray for them, is to learn to effect the will of God in their lives through your prayers, through your prayers, through your intercession. Uh, I remember in that book he mentioned a certain girl uh, in, uh, who was, I think, a, a niece of his, that is Kenneth Hagin, and he said for a, a long period, he kept on having a feeling, a sensation of someone, uh, someone's head being, I mean, like, uh, being cut off or or like someone's head leaving them. And he kept having that feeling in his heart, and he would pray, and he did not know exactly how to deal with it. He didn't pray enough. But he says along the way, uh, this uh, niece of his got an accident uh, in a vehicle, and their head just, I mean, was cut off and, uh, and flew out of the, of the window. And he says he realized 
that that is the thing that God wanted him to, if, I mean, to change. And that is the thing that God wanted him to deal with. You need to understand this child of God, that there are many people who die before their time. And there are many people who die when they're not supposed to die. There are many people who end up in wrong uh, places when they're not supposed to. Or because we Christians have not understood our role, our position as intercessors to pray and to effect changes in people's lives. Sometimes, yes, truth is, it's very frustrating when you're dealing with rebellious people. People, you tell the right thing and they keep on doing the opposite. You keep on trying to change, to, I mean, to change them. They mock you. You keep on trying, even when you're praying for them. Some even would, would even ask you, why don't you pray for yourself? Uh, we also see there are certain things you lack in your life, but you need to understand this child of God, that as an intercessor, you don't get your, your praise from men. You don't get your, your directions from men. Some of the people you pray for may actually be the ones that want to hurt you, yet you're praying for good things for them. So you need to understand this, and you need to position yourself as an intercessor. You must be dead to the feelings of people and to the things that people think about you. So you must be, I mean, you must be able to stand between heaven and earth and say, God, have mercy on my father. Lord, have mercy on my mother. Lord, have mercy on my brother. Have mercy on my sister. Have mercy on my loved ones, Lord. Let them not be lost. Let them not be uh, found in destruction. Let them be, I mean, let them see the light. Show them the light. Send someone to them. Send someone to speak to them. Send someone to I mean, to, to, to correct them. Send someone they will listen to. They may not listen to me, but send them someone that they will listen to. Give them encounters. Knock them wherever they are. I mean, bring them back to their senses in different kind of things. I, I, I mean, pray, intercede. Pray, intercede. Stand in the gap until the people that you love see the light and begin moving in the right direction. And this is not only limited to your, I mean, to your relatives. No, this is for everyone, for mankind. We are called as intercessors for mankind. You can just see someone who is not doing well at your workplace and you decide you're going to pray for the light of God to shine upon that person and for them to see the light and do what is right. Let me tell you something. When, you pray, when we put men before God, men are helpless against, I mean, against our prayers. Listen, you can talk to someone and they refuse, but when you come before God on their behalf, they are totally helpless because once God answers you, once God... Uh, accepts and says, okay, I've had your prayers concerning that person, then that person's life becomes, I mean, gets better. And then you, I mean, God takes the praise and he gives you rewards in Jesus' mighty name. So we are to be situated between heaven and earth as intercessors. We as Christians, we are to be situated between heaven and earth as what? As intercessors. For one reason, by the way, is because it's only us that God is obligated to hear our prayers. God, uh, many people uh, uh, religious people don't like to hear this, but let me tell you something. God is not under any kind of obligation to hear prayers of sinners. The only people God is bound by us, by his word to hear uh, their prayers is us who believe in him and that put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's why when we pray, it's so much different. They will tell you, oh, we also pray for ourselves, but actually it is, like I said, God is only mandated to hear prayers that are proceeding from us his children through faith in the name of Jesus Christ. But uh, before I, I mean uh, I finish, let's now move to what are we supposed to pray for? What are we to intercede for? Because if we don't know what to intercede for, we can also end up wasting a lot of time in prayer. And so we pray for long, but we don't see results. Why? Because the, as the Bible says, we are praying amiss. We are not focusing our prayers in the direction that they're supposed to be moving. We are not asking for definite things. Therefore, we don't have definite answers. That's why on Sunday we looked at, uh, number one, we're supposed to pray for the harvest of souls, Matthew 9, 38, and Luke 10, verse 2, and 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 to 4. All those scriptures show us that the people that we desire to be saved cannot be saved unless we pray for them. Why? Because they are lost. They can't find themselves. They are lost. They can't see the need for salvation. When we intercede for them, when we pray for them, the light shines upon them. When God sends them people to speak to them, their hearts are already prepared. And number two, I'm skipping the ones we talked about on Sunday, just running over them, uh, uh, and then I'll, I'll focus on the ones for today. We saw that we are to intercede against degeneration. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21 tells us that God has planted us a true vine. How is it that we have become a de degenerate uh, plant? That is, there's a law uh, of backsliding, that when people spend long in a certain path, on a certain path, in a certain direction. 
There's a tendency to draw back. There's a tendency to lose their first love. There's a tendency to lose their first fire. And because of that, people don't fulfill their destiny on schedule. But now we are to pray against backsliding. We are to pray against degeneration of morals in society, degeneration of faith, degeneration of things that we believe we are handed over to the church as core values. Jude chapter 3, verse number, actually Jude is only one chapter, it's, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, uh, when I wrote to you concerning the common salvation, it was needful for me, to, uh, beloved, when I, get, I, when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should honestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. There's a degeneration of faith. There's a degeneration of faith. People who used to believe God are now uh, propagating all manner of solutions uh, to mankind and to people. And it's like they, they think, oh, this is just another thing. Uh, it doesn't take away uh, faith and doesn't take away God. Listen, listen. God is the first solution. God is the middle solution. God is the last solution. All other things are within God. All the other solutions are within God. So we see that uh, we are exhorted in Jude verse 3 to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That is also something we have to intercede for right now. That men may go back to the original faith that was once delivered to the saints. That when you have a challenge, the first option is faith. That when there's a, a, an opinion, the first option is faith. How dare you think that mankind can provide a solution for the same problem that they created? Listen, child of God, do not be deceived into all this kind of um, how can I, intellectualism and all manner of common sense and all kind of reasoning, human reasoning, thinking, oh, I think this is the solution. If only we can all do this. If only we can all do that. Let me tell you, child of God, listen to me and listen properly. You're either going to believe God or you're going to be at the mercy of men. But let me assure you, men cannot provide a solution for the same problem that they created. This thing was not created, I mean, did not come from anywhere. This thing was, was man-made. This thing can only be dealt with by God. Now, if you understand what I'm talking about, shout amen. If you don't understand, go ahead. But what I'm trying to tell you is contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. What kind of faith that God is a healer, that for we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was, uh, I mean, for we know the grace uh, no, 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 uh, first, uh, uh, first Peter 2.24, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on a tree, that we being dead to sins may live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. Matthew 8.17, surely he has borne uh, our sicknesses and carried our diseases. Uh -huh. uh, Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our diseases, but we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Let us contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That what? That God is a healer. That God heals to the uttermost. That God heals everything. That God heals at all times. That God heals in the morning. God heals in the evening. God heals in the afternoon. God heals Every time, God heals everything. God is a healer. Apostle, does not mean that we don't do any other thing. Every other thing must rotate about around that kind of understanding. And that should be the message that we as Christians are sounding for. And that should be the message that we are blowing on a trumpet. Why? Because that is our confidence. And that is the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Why? Because once you begin to make man your solution, what happens is that you're setting yourself up because there will be certain things that man has solution for. And by the time you run to God, it will be too late for you to, to cultivate your what? Your faith. So we are to pray for the harvest of souls. We are to pray against degeneration, against backsliding, against backsliding of all kinds. We are, and I'm talking about backsliding of faith, where you find that you no longer propagate the things of God. You're busy propagating human knowledge and science as the solution for the problems of mankind, while at the same time saying you are a preacher of the gospel. Number three, 
we are inter to intercede against the spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit. Fear is a spirit that cripples. Fear is a spirit that torments. Fear is a spirit that paralyzes. Fear, fear is a spirit that makes people, I mean, incap it, 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 it amputates people and stops them from fulfilling their potential. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear. So where does fear come from? Fear is given. Fear is given. No one was born with fear. Look at a child, a young child. Uh, like uh, I have a, a very young one at home. Uh, I mean, if, if they begin to move, they don't care. Why? Because, I mean, they have no fear. They, can, they, can, they, would, they would want to roll over the bed. They want to roll over, over, over even if it's 100, uh, I mean, 100 feet high. They don't care. Why? Because there's no fear. That shows us that there is no one born with fear. Fear comes when we begin to talk to them. <laughs> fear comes, begin, uh, comes when we begin now to assure them of what will happen when they fall, of what will happen when... But for them, they start off without fear. Fear is given. Of course, you are supposed to teach them because there are certain laws they must abide by. But listen, fear comes from the devil. The spirit of fear comes from the devil. Now, you as a child of God must understand that any moment, any second, any, any time that you're in fear over anything, you are in the flesh. Why? Because the spirit realm, the realm of God, knows no fear. The, you shall be far from oppression, and you shall be far from torment, for you shall what? You shall not fear. That's what the Bible says. 365 times the Bible tells us not to what? To fear. Isaiah 54, verse number 14. Also, the, that is... Isaiah 54, verse 14, says, In righteousness you shall be established, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Intercede against the spirit of fear that, is, that wants to come upon the whole world. Every time there's some news of some new variant, every time there's some news of something, that, 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 something new, something, some, something more dangerous, something, there is that fear that the enemy is pushing on men. Why? Because he knows that once men are taken by fear, there he can wreak havoc day and night without any kind of hindrance. Why? Because fear is the devil's territory. It is the devil's... I mean, if, if a fish needs water to swim, the devil needs fear to operate. Fear is to the devil what water is to a fish. Fear is to the devil what the sky is to an eagle. So the devil needs fear for him to operate in people's lives. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible tells us, for as much as, uh, I mean the children, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, and uh, let's begin from verse 14. Hebrews 2, verse 14, for as much as then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through the fear of death where all their lifetime subject to bondage. People are subject to bondage because of the fear of death. People are subject to bondage because of the fear of death. Deal with fear and you have eliminated the devil out of your life. Now fear a lot of times comes, like I said, like, like a presence, a heavy presence. You must intercede against it. You must bind the spirit of fear. You must cast it out. You must destroy it. You must decree it. That fear is not permitted in this church. Fear is not permitted in this home. Fear is not permitted in this family. Fear is not permitted in our surrounding. Why? Because only faith is required. And only faith is permitted in this place in Jesus' mighty name. And so today, we shall be looking at the fourth, which is interceding against... Uh, no, no, even on Sunday we talk about human nature. We need to also intercede against human nature. Human nature is, is wicked. There are two aspects. There's a natural ability of it in that it is limited. But there's also the evil uh, thing in that in, in human nature. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 to 10. It tells us about uh, Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah chapter 17, uh, verse 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse number 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. Let me tell you something. The, when the Bible says, cast is, any, is anyone who trusts in man. When the Bible says, cast is anyone. 
cursed is anyone who trusts in man. You need to understand that by that God means that man is limited. Man is, because of the fall, man is by nature wicked. You get it? So you need to be, I mean, you need to know how to pray against human nature. In other words, if you put your faith in human beings of all kinds and think that they, are, they have the will and the ability to deliver to you what you desire, you are bound to fail. You need to intercede against human nature. You need to intercede against human nature. The hum, I mean, human mistakes, human shortcomings. Someone is supposed to do something and they don't do it, and because of that, you miss out on your destiny. You need to intercede against human nature, such kind of shortcomings, such kind of failings, such kind of forgetfulness, such kind of ill will, animosity, such kind of plan, evil plans of human beings. You need to intercede against them. Why? Because if you don't, then you find yourself in a position where you're blaming people for what is not happening in your life. Now, you need to understand the Bible says in Psalms 110 verse 3, thy people shall be willing in the day of your power. You need to understand how to bring every human being in your life in line with your prosperity. You pray them into alignment. And those who are against and those who won't work for it, you pray them out. And you pray those who are meant to assist you, meant to help you to, to fulfill their positions and to do what they're supposed to do in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, Number five, as, a, as we look at, of course, uh, for today, is we are to intercede against nature and its elements. Nature and its elements. And I'm going to explain this in a short while. Psalms 121, verse 6 to 8. We are to intercede against nature and its elements. We are to intercede against nature and its elements. Psalms 121, verse 6 says, The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. Verse 8. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth even forevermore. There is something called nature. We all know. In fact, some people in the world even have a cult uh, called Mother Nature. They believe that nature is God. But I want to tell you, nature is powerful. Nature is powerful. Nature is created by God. And it is very powerful. What is nature in this kind? And what elements are we talking about? We are talking about the sun. We are talking about the moon. We are talking about water. We are talking about air. We are talking about creatures. All these things that God has created, they are created for us. They are created for man. They are not created for us to worship them. They are created to serve us. The sun is supposed to serve us. What, how? By giving us light. Psalms 121 verse 6 says, it shall not smite you by day. In other words, if the sun begins to burn you, it means the sun is being rebellious or it is overstretching itself. The sun is, <laughs> is created by God to serve you, to give you vitamin D, to give you light, to give you all the things, that, to give plants the required, uh, I mean, a light that they need. And some of you now are totally lost, but there's a process called photosynthesis. Uh, <laughs> but that... that uh, requires sunlight for plants to be able to, to produce their food. So the, that is the purpose of the sun. But if the sun scorches you, and if the sun overstands, uh, overextends itself, like in the days of drought, uh, in the days of, uh, of the dry seasons that are prolonged and people can't plant, then the, that means that nature is working against us. That means that nature is working against you. We have seen that in, uh, in things like hurricanes and, uh, and storms and, and floods and all manner of, of things that come, of course, like, uh, as, uh, like judgments of God. It means that God has used, is using nature to turn against mankind. But we also know that the devil manipulates nature against mankind because he's a spirit and he knows how to. So if we do not understand how to intercede against nature, we may find ourselves always on the wrong side. In other words, the, it, it rains too much when you don't want to rain, and the side, it, shines, uh, it, it shines a lot, uh, too hot when you don't want it to shine, and then uh, when you want it to be cold, it's hot, when you want it to be... Now, listen, you're supposed to have perfect weather for you to do what you're supposed to do. Many of you are saying, Apostle, is that important? You need to know how many people miss out on their destiny just because nature is against them. Let me tell you something. This is a part. This is something that also you are supposed to.
to intercede for as a Christian. Now, in this time, we are dealing with a certain rebellion in nature called, of course, COVID-19. We know we have been dealing with that. What is that? The air. The Bible says God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So what God breathed into man and what God put in the air for us to breathe in is oxygen and it is his breath. It is his life. How did it turn out that now we have to put masks on our faces to, I mean, to sieve the same thing that God gave us for free? It means that oxygen or whatever is in the air that we breathe is in rebellion. So we must pray and intercede against nature. In other words, the, I mean, even the air itself must reject coronavirus. It must reject it. Why? Because it is created by God to give us life, not death. If someone is, uh, some, even, uh, some, some people even fear now to talk, I mean, of course, like next to one another. Why? Because it is risky. But we all know how Jesus healed people in the, in the New Testament. How would he manage, uh, how would Jesus operate on this earth right now? Because we know that for many people, Jesus breathed upon them. He blew air on them. But many of you, if I blew air on you, you would sue me. Why? Because <laughs> your, your faith now has changed. <laughs> Whatever was meant to bless you, you, it's now you're scared. Why? Because faith has degenerated. Faith has been eliminated. Faith is being what? Is being attacked. And men are putting their... Now listen, when God breathed on man, he breathed the breath of life. When Jesus came, countless times, he breathed on people. And whatever, whenever he breathed on them, they received life more abundant. I think now we should be careful because even, I mean, in the days of Jesus, he did radical things like spitting in the mud and getting out the, the spit off from the mud, putting in the blind man's eyes and all, and all those sensitive parts. And, uh, and the man came out seeing. Uh, he went and washed and he saw. And now, now you, you need to understand, child of God, I am not a spokesman uh, for, for, I mean, for, 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 for the Ministry of Health, neither am I a spokesman for the World Health Organization. I'm an ambassador of heaven. I'm an apostle sent by God to tell you that we need to intercede against nature. We need to intercede against elements. Air was created to be breathed freely, freely, without a mask. Air was created to be, to be enjoyed, to be enjoyed, to be, to, I mean, we are created to celebrate what God has given us. Are you listening, somebody? No. Are you, are, you, are you saying we shouldn't mask up? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you need to understand that that's not your portion. And you need to begin to deal with it in the realm of the spirit so that it, it goes uh, sooner than later. Are you listening to somebody? So we are to intercede against the elements of nature. What is in there? What is in the air that is causing people to mask up? There's death in there. There's death in there through, through COVID-19. There's a virus. I mean, bacteria. Many of you don't understand. When you think of virus, when you think of bacteria, these are organisms. These are, these are creatures. These are things. These are things. Yes, they cannot be seen with a naked eye, but they are things. You can think of them, when you think of a plague of corona, think of a plague like, like now in Australia, there's a plague of rats. Rats everywhere. Men, I, I mean, you, you imagine a plague of lions, okay, like multiplied lions that have invaded the city and they want to eat up everyone. That's what COVID is. They are organisms. They are creatures. They are rebellious animals in the, realm, in the unseen realm with the naked eye that have invaded our air, the air we are supposed to be breathing. We are to intercede until the air is pure. Are you listening, somebody? We are to intercede until the air is as pure as God created it to be, at least the air that we, be, we breathe in as Christians. Water can be a problem. Revelation chapter 16, verse number 4, tells us of uh, this uh, kind of judgment. Revelation 16, 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. You see, all these elements, water, air, I mean, uh, creatures, wild animals, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, the oceans, all these things, they are created to serve us as creatures, not to be destroying us, not to be working against us. So we have to learn to intercede and to pray and to command them to behave. When Jesus was attacked by the storm on the ocean, he didn't say, oh, I wish we had traveled earlier. Oh, I wish we had traveled later because the winds were contrary. No, he stood up and he said, peace, be still. 
and immediately the sea obeyed. And what did the disciples say? They were astonished that even the wind and the sea obey him. What manner of man is this? Now, you need to understand this, that you can speak to the air that you breathe. Yes. And say, air that I breathe, be healed. And you, you, you put a guard over your nose and over your mouth and say, whatever passes here is only what is permitted by God to be in hell. Are you listening, someone? In other words, speak to everything around your life. The sun, the moon, the air. Right now, we are focusing on the air. We pray for the healing power of God to invade the air that we breathe, that there may not be death, but life in the air that we breathe in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14, that's why the Bible says that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin. Listen to this. And I will heal their land, not their bodies. I will heal their land, meaning the land is sick. And because the land is sick, that's why people get sick. So be, if God heals people and the land remains sick, then people will continue to be sick. But what we need now is not just Mulago to be evacuated. I mean, to all the people in Mulago, or all the care centers to be healed. We need healing over the land. We need healing over the air that we breathe. Wherever the virus has touched, wherever it is, let it be scorched by divine fire, by Holy Ghost fire, and let it die. We decree healing over our land. We decree healing over the nations of the world. We decree healing over the air in the mighty name of Jesus. All across the nations of the world, we declare healing over the air in Jesus' mighty name. We decree a time comes when the air is fresh, when people don't have to mask up, when people don't have to be worried about the air that they are breathing in. Why? Because we declare healing from heaven upon the air, the air that God gave mankind to breathe. We declare healing from India to China. We declare healing from Australia to Brazil to South America. We declare healing from Canada to Mexico. We declare healing from England to Russia. We declare healing all over Asia and the Arab world. We declare healing over Africa in the mighty name of Jesus from Cape Town, I mean, to, to Cairo, from, uh, from, from, from Senegal to Mombasa to Somalia. We declare healing over the nations of the world in the mighty name of Jesus. We decree that air heal. We command coronavirus to die in the mighty name of Jesus. We command coronavirus to die in the name of Jesus. We decree healing over the air in the mighty name of Jesus. And... Um, uh, we also are supposed to intercede against determined things. We are to intercede against determined things. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 1 tells us, The whole the day cometh when it that shall burn as the oven, and all the proud, yea, even uh, that do wickedness shall be a stubble. The day cometh that shall burn them, up, burn them up, says the Lord, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with the healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as the calves of the stone. Let me tell you something, child of God. There are some determined things. There are things that are meant to happen. And if you pray against such kind of things, you may not get the results that you desire. And it, there may be frustration. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the Bible shows us that Daniel was praying, but he was praying in the right time. Uh -huh. Uh, he had to pray in the right time. Daniel 9.24 says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 70 weeks were determined. Now, even in the days of Jeremiah, he was prophesying a certain form of captivity that, has come to, that was to come upon the children of Israel in Babylon. And he said it would take 70 years. Now, before the 70 years are over, you can pray, you can fast, you can do all that you want to do, and you still won't see results. So you need to understand. But what do you do in such kind of situation? If there are things that are determined, if there are things that are meant to happen, what do you do? Like the end time, I mean, confusion that is going on, that is prophesied in the scriptures. What do you do? You as a child of God, 
need to know how to pray exemption for yourself. You need to understand that, yes, these things are determined to happen on the earth. These things are determined to happen on the earth for those that don't believe in God. But for you that believes in God, you that fears the name of God, you need to know how to secure yourself exemption. You need to know how to secure yourself exemption. In Malachi, again, chapter 3, verse 17, it talks about a difference, God making a difference between those who serve him and those who don't serve him. Eh? Let's begin from verse 16, uh, Malachi 3, verse 16. Then they who fear the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And the book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and the thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serveth him. In verse 18 it says, Then shall you return and discern the right, between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Now what does that mean? It means that God wants always to make a difference between those who serve him and those who don't serve him. God always wants to make sure that his children are exempted from certain things that happen to every other person on the face of the earth. So as a child of God, you need to know how to decree and how to pray your case is different. You need to know that when men are cast down, you shall say there is a lifting up. You need to know that there are certain things, yes, that may be permitted on the sons of men, but they are not permitted in your household because you are what? You are a child of God, because you are exempted, because you are you are set apart because you're sealed, because you're marked for good things. So as a child of God, you also need to know, yes, there are determined things. There are things that are meant to happen. If they decree curfew upon the whole land and, and you're not the president, you can't change that. So you're not going to say, uh, I am exempted, so I'm going to ride my bike beyond 6 p.m. No, you're going to get arrested. So you are, you are exempted from the effect of that decree in that you will not suffer because of that decree. You will not go down because of that decree. You will, not, you will not sink because of that decree. You will not drown because of that decree. Are you listening, somebody? So don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Don't be caught up with whatever takes over the whole world because you know how to intercede exemption upon yourself. And lastly, but not least, we are to subdue the flesh in intercession. I reserve this one for last because, yes, it is very important. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Romans Chapter 7, verse number 18. The Bible says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Did you know, child of God, that your flesh is actually a greater enemy of your destiny than the devil himself? Did you actually know that your flesh is a greater enemy of your progress than the devil himself? You say, Apostle, how? Because you see, the devil works, attacks you from the outside. But the flesh attacks you from the inside. Your inability, you see, once you subdue the flesh, like the Bible says, that uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 32. Proverbs 16, verse 32. What does the Bible say? He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. What does that mean? That a man who controls his flesh is greater than a person who takes over a city. Do you know what that means? That if you can subdue your flesh, the city will be too easy for you. The city will be too small for you if only you can subdue the flesh. The flesh always comes in to preserve itself, to exalt itself, to protect itself. You want to fast, but you feel like you may get so weak and so you have to eat even when you're supposed to fast. You want to fast, but you want to look so good. So you think when you fast, you won't look good, so you're preserving yourself. You want to fast, but you feel the flesh always gets in the way. Why? Because the flesh loves self-preservation, self-exaltation, self-defense. Now, you must learn two things or two ways to deal with the flesh. One, crucify it. The flesh must be crucified. The flesh must be crucified. It must be put to death. How do you put it to death? One of the ways is through fasting. Why? Because the flesh gets its energy by food. When a person is weak, even their sins reduce. When a person gets hungry and uh, they are not eating, 
even their ability to do wrong reduces. Why? Because there's something about the flesh that it draws its energy from food. It draws its energy from pleasure. Once pleasure is cut off from the flesh, that is crucifying the flesh. And then you find that the life of the spirit begins to rise and you find yourself doing so much more than you are able to do in Jesus' mighty name. So the first way you deal with the flesh is to crucify it. And you crucify it through fasting. And the second way to deal with the flesh is to supply more of the Spirit of God. To supply more of the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8, verse number 13, it tells us, but if we, after the, I mean, if we live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. The flesh, a lot of times, what, I mean, it, it is in, incapable of doing the right thing until there's a supply of the Spirit of God into the life of man. Because your, once your spirit is energized by the Spirit of God, it overpowers the energy and the temptation of the flesh. And thank God fasting gives us those two, I mean, those two supplies. Number one, it crucifies the flesh. Number two, it opens up our hearts to receive more of the Spirit of God, thereby putting to death the deeds of the body. I believe and hope that you have been blessed tonight by that teaching, and I believe that your life cannot remain the same in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Position yourself as an intercessor. Pray for the souls of men to be saved. Pray against degeneration. Pray against the spirit of fear. Pray against a human nature. Pray against nature and its elements. Pray against determined things and uh, seek exemption. And then last but not least, subdue the flesh in prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. I see you returning on Sunday with your testimony of glory in Jesus' mighty name. I speak over you energy. I speak over you grace to maximize this season of our spiritual week of empowerment. I decree in the name of Jesus Christ, everything standing between you and your desired destiny is destroyed in the name of Jesus Christ. I decree the supply of the Spirit of God more abundantly into your spirit. Let every enemy of your destiny working from within be eliminated in the name of Jesus Christ. I decree concerning your life, healing and restoration in Jesus' name. You shall not be moving backward. You shall be moving forward in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that raised against you in judgment is concerned, is condemned. I rebuke the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ. I decrease the supply of the spirit of faith more abundantly in the mighty name of Jesus. I decree in the name of Jesus Christ, as you have seen it, as you have prayed it, as you have desired it, so shall it be in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you. Thank you so much for being part of this uh, week's uh, midweek service. I believe I'll see you again on Sunday, first to first, uh, in Bukoto at Amazing Faith Church at 10.30 a.m. in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I never want to live without giving you a chance to give your life to Jesus Christ. Pray this prayer with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, come before you. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am born again. I am a child of God. In Jesus' mighty name. If you pray that prayer, call the numbers on the screen, 773-322-81, 7543-222-81, and you'll be assisted accordingly in Jesus' mighty name. Also want to give you an opportunity to give uh, to those numbers, 773-322-81, and 0754-322-81, 0773-322-81, and 0754-322-81. Make use of those numbers to give your tithe and your offerings, and the Lord will shall bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord preserve you in Jesus' mighty name. See you on Sunday at 10.30 a.m. in the name of Jesus.